Good evening, everybody. Good evening. It's good to sit with you. Um, my name is Kenko. Uh, I'm a senior student at the Village Zendo. Uh, and I practice with the Oxbow Zendo in Northampton, Massachusetts, where I live. Um, and I also teach mathematics and mathematics education at Westfield State University. Um, and I mentioned that because some of the explorations that I'll be taking you um, sort of touch on that field of mathematics, mathematics education, beliefs about ourselves as mathematicians and as learners of mathematics, um, and, and look at some connections um, between that and our Zen practice. Um, here in Northampton, um, I have a little weather app um, that um, in the last few days sort of had a red alert on it. And when I click on the red alert, it tells me that um, the Connecticut River um, is flooding a little, right? Because there has been um, a lot of rain in the last days. There has been even more rain up in Vermont. Um, and the Connecticut River um, starts um, between Vermont and New Hampshire and comes down, 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 and runs right through Massachusetts, where I live. And it was interesting, um, yesterday it said that there would be flooding in Montague. Um, and again, there are also dikes. So usually the warning says, you know, agricultural fields outside the dikes may experience minor or moderate flooding. Um, and on some level, um, these areas have flooded for probably centuries. And then at some point, um, people got sick of having their towns flooded too. So they, they build a dike around that. And then today it was, so Montague is uh, like, you know, 15, 20 minutes north of here. And then today it said, oh, Northampton, um, some flooding. So it sort of made me realize that somehow I had the thought that if there is flooding up in Mon Montague, all the water should be down here much more quickly. So why does it take sort of a whole day for that to get here? And then also realize that in a way, it's not the same water that's flooding, right? It's the water actually goes, but somehow the, the water level rising is, is sort of created by different water. And um, just below Northampton, there is actually a mountain range that runs east-west. So usually mountains um, in the Northeast run like this, except one or a few of them run like that. And, and I was reminded of Roshi's talk about the Palisades because that mountain range, um, the Seven Sisters and Mount Tom um, are also um, based on lava flows that cooled a long time ago. And then eventually, um, and then there was some kind of lake that was created and eventually the lake broke through and now we just have a river. Um, otherwise I would be living underwater where I am right now. And right before the river goes through that barrier of the mountains, there is an old oxbow. And that's where the flooding is. And that's the oxbow of Oxbow Zen. Yeah. A circle, not quite complete. Sometimes it swells and sometimes it dries. And um, it sort of encompasses the relationship between the mountains and the waters right here today. And today that area is flooded a little bit. Sort of the slow moving water also reminds me of um, sort of the slow moving changes in the air and in the climate that got started um, in the industrial revolution um, in Europe. It's like, oh, let's start burning this coal and get energy and have all this, all this energy to produce things and do things and um, not pull the, and, and have, um, 
railways and have commerce and have all of that. It started a long time ago, and it looks like the looks like the wave is finally getting here in a way that we can clearly see and feel and experience. Uh, I was in Germany earlier this summer visiting family and there too. Um, in June, it was unusually hot and it had been unusually dry. Um, and then all of a sudden you get these um, downpours like, like with strong winds and heavy rains. So it's so it, it it feels like huh you know this is this is a strange new pattern there and it's a strange new pattern here and to somehow see that on a global scale some of those connections is um, is, is really powerful for me. So today I'd like to um, talk a little bit about. Um, learning and beliefs about, about ourselves and and the power we have and the power we sometimes give away uh, often without really knowing it or being aware of it um, there is a, a beautiful little um, video um, of a, a, a second grader um, her name is Gretchen um, and she's um, given some problem that I would describe ultimately as a subtraction kind of problem. And um, so there are some counters and then the counters change. And then the question is, well, you know, how many, how many counters got added? And she carefully records and she moves the pieces around and she groups them and she makes sense of that. And she writes down what she believes the answer is. Um, and, and, and from a mathematical point of view, she does exactly the right things. Right? So it totally makes sense to her. It totally makes sense. The answer actually makes sense. And then she wants to check her work. And she pulls out a piece of paper and she uses the standard algorithm for subtraction, which is a process that many of us are familiar with. And that's sort of a little bit sort of there are rules and they're a little bit mysterious, but we know that you have to follow them very closely because otherwise you're going to get in big trouble. So Gretchen is a second grader, so um, she's still a little new with that whole process and somebody probably showed her. And, and she goes through the steps and um, she makes a little mistake and she gets a different result. And, and, and to her credit, I mean, uh, you know, the mathematics educator in me says, you know, it's wonderful that she recognizes that the two answers can't be true at the same time, right? So this is unexpected. And, and the sad thing is uh, she trusts the algorithm. She trusts the process. She trusts the, the steps that somebody told her. Um, and disregards um, and dismisses um, her own sense making, where she could really see every step. And yet ultimately this, this rule-based process tells her a different answer. And that's the piece where she puts her trust and she says, I think this is the answer. So who's the, who's, be, who's the expert in that case? Where does the power for telling us the truth get located? Well, it's the, it's the process that everybody uses and that must that is the way that I'm supposed to do it and that's what people do. And I'm, I'm noticing that as a, as a teacher in the class too. So my students work in small groups on problems and then they sort of write it up and they discuss and they disagree and they come to some kind of conclusions. And I go around and check in with them and say, so um, what are you guys thinking? And um, early in the semester, um, the most common question that I get is um, sort of, here's what we did. Is this right? right? 
So it's like they're looking to me as the authority to validate what it is that they have done, because clearly I'm the expert, because I'm the professor, I have the title, I'm teaching this class, so I should be the one to judge, is this right or not? And for many of my students um, who are future elementary school teachers, um, there is also an underlying belief that um, I am not a math person. Right? So if that is a belief that I have, then clearly I need to ask a math person if something is true or not, because I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not the kind of person who can judge that. And that to me is very interesting because there is a there's a very broadly held societal belief here in the US that there actually is something like a math person or not a math person. And those are beliefs that people bond over. You know, um, at a party, it's like, oh, you know, I was never good at math. Oh, I was never good at math either. And my mom wasn't good at, at math. So so it's it's interesting how it 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 forms it's a belief that i believe is not true at all and has no basis in reality yet it's very commonly held and it it, it plays a role and it sort of gets its energy from the fact that people can bond over it and and if that's my belief about myself then you know of course um i need i need someone else to tell me if something makes sense And I think this is true for many of us in many, many different areas of our lives, right? I mean, math, it's just, it's just one point of one area that I know about simply because I have a lot of experience with it. Um, I think finance is another one where um, it feels like, oh, this is something that I need an expert for. It's interesting. Like, you know, why, why is that? Um, maybe it's related to the mathematical and numerical aspect of it. It's like, oh, I couldn't possibly make sense of that. So I need someone else. And I think the, the other piece about it is um, there are sort of larger systems in place that, um, that, that keep that disempowerment in place too. Right. I mean, I think um, schools and math class is one way how that belief gets handed down to the next generation. Um, families, parents um, hand that down to the next generation. Um, we as a society um, hand that down to the next generation. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's so commonly held a belief that it's like obvious and we just hand it on to the, to the next generation. So how about your own life? What sort of areas where you're aware that, that your mind tells you that you need experts to make sense of them, something? And, and it may be totally true. Um, you know, um, I mean, we, we just had um, you know, some critters in the walls. So it's like, what do you do with critters in the walls? Well, I assume they're some kind of expert. We can't be the first ones who have that, right? But, but where do we give away our own power of making sense of things? Where really, maybe we're the, the only expert, really. And how about in Zen practice? Oh, the teachers know it all. It's the teachers that have to say, yes, you pass the koan or you don't. And what role do I have in saying, this feels clear to me. Here is how I see that. Or um, um, this is still totally murky to me. Like, what is the role that, that we have in that? So there's a, a beautiful um, koan in the, um, in the Book of Serenity, um, The Woman of Taishan. So on the road to Taishan, there lived a certain woman. Whenever a monk asked her, which way does the road to Taishan go? The woman would say, 
right straight on. As soon as the monk would go, the woman would say, a fine priest, he goes that way too. The monk told Zhaozhu about this. Zhaozhu said, ah, wait till I check out that woman for you. Zhaozhu also asked the woman the same question. The next day he went up in the hall and said, I've checked out the woman for you. I wonder what the monk was thinking in receiving that answer. What do you mean you have checked out the woman for me? What is, what is your conclusion? Tell me the conclusion, what, what is it? So she says, right straight on. And as soon as the monk would go, she would say, a fine priest, he goes that way too. So something about that answer, I think, unsettled all those monks. And, and I wonder, what was, what was her tone of voice? You know, what was her body language? What was, the, what was going on in the, in the monk's mind in that exchange? It's like, oh, maybe I did something wrong. Maybe I should have done something else. But she said, right straight on. And I went right straight on. What, what's, what's happening here? What does she mean about a fine priest? Is there something that is wrong about me being a priest? Is there is everything, is my, my clothing all all set? Or am I maybe not really a, a real priest? Right. Do I have doubts about my accomplishment as a Zen student? And then he goes to the teacher. So he says, well, if I'm confused, let me go ask the expert. And, and here's the piece that I love about Jojo. Um, so it, it's a different response that I use in my classroom. Because um, when students ask me, well, is this right or not or wrong? Um, I usually say, well, you know, what did you do? And does it make sense to you? Right. So in a way, I immediately sort of reveal that uh, I'm, I'm not going to engage with this question of right and wrong, but, but Zhaozhu uses a different tool, right? He says, ah, yes, of course, you have a question, I will go, I will take care of that for you. It's a little bit like, um, you know, the, the hook, it's like the hook is set. Right? And you just wait for the, for the rope to tighten and pull you out of the water. Wait till I check out that woman for you. The Buddha said, be a lamp unto yourself. Be a refuge to yourself. Take yourself to no external refuge. So what are the external refuges that you find yourself drawn to? And explore what would it mean to be a refuge to yourself? Uh, similarly, Sawaki Roshi also put it uh, sort of using slightly different language. He said, um, you can't even trade a single fart with the next person. Each and every one of us has to live out their own life. And he continues, he says, religion means living your own life, completely fresh and new, without being taken in by anyone. without being taken in by anyone, including your own thoughts about yourself and what you can and what you can't do and who the expert is or isn't, without being taken in by anyone. So um, Ango is coming up. Um, and I loved, I was in, this morning, it, it was beautiful to sort of read the two, um, names of the two sessions you know 
returning to silence and the voice of wisdom. So for me, um, Sazen and returning to silence is really a way of getting in touch with well, with so much, but including it um, with when I'm trying to look for someone else um, to take care of my situation. And then when I return to silence, there may be a voice, a quiet voice, a shy voice in my heart that that otherwise I can't hear. So I hope that um, you in your own practice, be it on session, be it individually, that you have a chance to return to silence and to really get in touch with that voice of wisdom. Thank you.